Okay, and um, I'm going to now screen share. And before we start that, of course, since I remembered, um, we'll begin with our little reading that uh, is, is so appropriate um, for our storytelling. So when the great rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov saw misfortune threatening the world, it was his custom to go into a certain part of the forest to meditate. There, he would light a fire, say a special prayer, and the miracle would be accomplished and the misfortune averted. Later, when his disciple, the celebrated Magid of Mizrich, had occasion for the same reason to intercede with heaven, he would go to the same place in the forest and say, Master of the universe, listen, I do not know how to light the fire, but I am still able to say the prayer. And again, the miracle would be accomplished. Still later, Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasov, in order to save his people once more, would go into the forest and say, I do not know how to light the fire. I do not know the prayer, but I know the place. And this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient, and the miracle was accomplished. Then it fell to Rabbi Israel of Rijin to overcome his fortune. Sitting in his armchair, his head in his hands, he spoke to God, I'm unable to light the fire, and I do not know the prayer. I cannot even find the place in the forest. All I can do is to tell the story and this must be sufficient, and it was sufficient. So now we're going to uh, um, start with this story. Um, and uh, I figured it would be appropriate to uh, read the story of Mordechai and Esther right before Purim. But of course, this is a different story of Mordechai and Esther, although uh, it might be uh, um, fun for us to, uh, as we listen to the story, think about different elements of the story and how they line up with the, with the Megillah story. So it's the story of Mordechai and Esther. It's a folk story that comes from Salonika, from uh, uh, the Greek uh, city, which once upon a time before the uh, Shoah had a huge thriving Jewish community. Uh, and uh, this is a story that comes from that place. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll begin and see how it goes. Um, who's going to volunteer to read for us, please? Oh, I guess I will. I'll give it the good old college try if nobody else wants to read. Okay. It's all yours. In the city of Salonika, under the Turks, there lived many years ago a great and wealthy scholar named Rabbi Simha who had a daughter named Esther. She was an extremely beautiful and clever girl, learned, learned in both Jewish and secular subjects and excelling all her father's pupils in her knowledge of the Torah. When her father went on his various journeys to ins inspect the communities under his care, Esther would put a veil over her face and taking her father's seat would teach his pupils so well that they could follow the most learned discussion with ease. Could you put well, the I'm picture trying, in the corner? I'm trying to get this thing. Somebody wanted to join, so I'm. Oh, okay. What can I tell you? So, okay, if you could raise it up. Okay, here we go. Okay. So when he took, uh, when he went on the various journeys, start please from Esther would put. Um, Esther would put a veil over her face and taking her father's seat which would teach his pupils so well that they could follow the most learned discussion with ease. When the time came for her to marry, she was inundated with proposals from the noblest and wealthiest families far and wide across the country. Each prospective suitor came to the rabbi's house and Esther plied them with difficult questions on legal points, testing their learning. If there was a single point which they did not fully understand, she would say, he is not for me. In this way, Esther failed all the suitors who came to her, even the most outstanding, and no worthy bridegroom could be found for her. 
She passed the age of 18, of 19, even of 20, uh, and still, uh, even of 20, and still Esther re remained unmarried. Her parents wept and pleaded with her not to be so demanding, to choose the best among them, and not to try God's patience, which is forbidden by Jewish law. But to their pleas, she only answered, the man destined for me has not yet appeared. She continued to learn and study, but the young men became frightened of being beaten in discussion and stopped coming to ask for her hand. At that time, a young orphan arrived in Salonika after wandering from city to city. He had no guardian, nor even a livelihood with which to support himself. The rabbi met him in the Beit Midrash, began talking to him and invited him to enter his household as a servant. The orphan boy was delighted at the opportunity and served the rabbi, his master, faithfully, always running eagerly to perform his wishes. The boy's name was Mordecai. He had no idea in which city he had been born, for his parents had died and he had begun his wanderings when he was only a small child. When the rabbi saw that the boy did not even know how to pray, he began to teach him to read. But Mordecai, unable to learn anything and mixed, all, and mixed all the letters up, forgetting each day what he had learned the day before, the rabbi grieved over the fact that his servant would have to remain illiterate all his days, and so did the boy who, in private, wept over his stupidity. When Esther saw how upset they both were, she suggested the boy should come to her for lessons and she would teach him to read. Her father replied with a laugh, you would find it easier to teach a bear to dance than to teach him his alphabet? Nevertheless, let me try. Perhaps I shall be successful, she replied. There they are studying. Mordecai then went to study with her. After one day, he knew all the letters of the alphabet. After a week, he could read with vowels. After a month, he could read from the prayer book. And after three months, he knew the meaning of all he read. Then she began to teach him Torah, Mishnah, Gemara. The boy took up his studies eagerly and worked night and day revising all that he had learned until he had caught up with the other pupils. Then he joined them in the rabbi's yeshiva and everybody was amazed at the wonderful progress he had made under Esther's guidance. One night, Esther came to her father's study where he was sitting, studying alone and standing at the door said, Father, I have something to ask you. Ask my daughter and your request will be granted, he replied. I should like to marry Mordecai. What? Did you see that coming? Did anybody guess that that might happen? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. I'm, I'm beginning to make a comparison between the the the, the, the story in the Megillah and this, and, okay. and the, the the change in in characters where characters are. Oh. are. We're gonna we're gonna look at that when we finish the whole story, the whole Megillah. Whatever you say, sir. You're the boss. What? Cried the rabbi in astonishment. You, my beloved daughter, want to marry a boy who does not even know the place of his birth who is so stupid that he has only managed to learn a little Torah through your perseverance? And after you have refused such fine young men of excellent family and wide learning, no, my child, don't bring such sorrow upon me. Calling his wife, he told her what had occurred, and she too rejected the idea of her daughter marrying a stranger of unknown origin. Should I give the apple of my eye to a serving boy who has learned with difficulty to read? I had rather die. But Esther was determined and informed her parents that if they refused to allow her to marry Mordecai, she would remain a spinster to her dying day. The parents... Oh, let me give you a little more room. Thank you. The parents sorrowed greatly, but did not know what they could do to rid their daughter of the madness which had seized her. At last, the rabbi thought of a plan and secretly summoned Mordecai to his study. Here is some money for you, he said. Take the ship that sails tonight for Italy and their study at the yeshiva. I have written a letter of recommendation to the head of the yeshiva. 
but don't write to me from there and send me no messages. This is not an idle wish, but something directed from heaven. If you transgress any of these instructions in any way on your on your own, head be it. On your the own head, head be it. On your own head, be it. The boy hearkened to his rabbi, took the money and the letter, and embarked on the ship waiting in the harbor. He did not know that Esther loved him, though he loved her very deeply. However, he had not dared to mention it, for he realized she was far above him in station. Next day, it was reported that Mordecai had run away from the yeshiva. When Esther heard, she hid herself in her room and wept bitterly for the loss of her lover refusing to be comforted and leaving her room only at rare intervals. Mordecai, meanwhile, was sailing on a calm sea beneath a clear moonlit sky, and next day, too, the sun shone on a tranquil sea. But when they were far out, a huge storm arose, and waves battered the ship so that the sailors could no longer steer it. The ship was driven to a distant shore, unknown to any of them, and was left stranded on the beach. When the storm had died, the inhabitants captured the ship and all it contained. Now one, now second, the, one second, let me, let me. Answer the phone. Sorry. Okay, so where are we? A huge storm arose. The ship was driven. When the ship died down, the inhabitants. Go ahead, start from the ship was driven, okay? Whatever you say. Thanks. The ship was driven to a distant shore, unknown to any of them, and was left stranded on the beach. When the storm died down, the inhabitants captured the ship and all it contained. Now, the inhabitants of that country were idolaters, worshiping the sun god. In the month of Tammuz, when the sun was high in the sky, they used to sacrifice a hundred bullocks and scatter their blood heavenward. They, then they stripped naked, dabbed themselves in blood, and lighting a huge bonfire, danced around it madly till the flames died down and they sank exhausted on the ground. Such was their practice year after year. Each man had three wives, <coughs> Excuse me. Each man had three wives, and when the father died, the eldest son inherited the house and his wives, the latter acting as mothers to his own three wives. The women and children used to stay to look after their rich flocks and pasture, while the men went to capture and loot passing ships. Then they would bring the spoil home, divide it amongst themselves, being careful to, to divide it fairly. This was the only virtue which the people possessed. Mordecai worked for them as a servant for months. And then when they saw that he was an intelligent youngster, they began to teach him the art of warfare, how to use a spear and dagger and all other instruments of battle. When he seemed ready to fight, they took him on their acts of piracy. On the first day that Mordecai went out to fight together with 10 of the pirates, they saw a huge boat drifting on the water, since the sailors had taken down the sails in order to repair them. 
The pirates fell on the ship, swinging aboard in order to loot it. But there happened to be soldiers on the ship, heavily armed for war, on their way to fight a battle. They soon overcame the pirates, throwing most of them overboard, but keeping a few. Mordecai among them is slaves. A few days later, they reached Africa, where they handed the slaves over to their ruler. The latter took a fancy to Mordecai and taught him their language until eventually he was appointed clerk of the court and advisor on legal matters. For Mordecai had remembered what he studied at the yeshiva and was learned in legal matters. In the course of time, the ruler asked Mordecai where he came from. I am a Jew, he replied, captured by pirates on my way to Italy where I intended to study. Then keep quiet and tell nobody, for according to our laws, Jews are forbidden to set foot in this territory. Now it was the custom of the people that when the ruler grew old, they shut him up in a cave to die and appointed a new ruler in his place. When this rule, ruler reached the age of 70, the leaders of the people came to his home, stripped him of his robes and prepared to lead him to the cave according to custom. The ruler accepted it all calmly, but before leaving, he turned to them and said, you know that I have served you faithfully all these years, neither oppressing you nor favoring individuals. I have pursued justice and no one can accuse me of perverting the law. Now I am ready to go to the place assigned for me by custom, but before leaving, never to return, I have one final wish. The leaders were moved at his words and cried, ask and we shall grant your request. Be so kind as to let me take this boy with me to the cave. The leaders were amazed at this request, Shall an upright judge do unjustly? What crime has this lad committed that he should be shut up to die in a cave when he is still so young? Don't refuse me, the ruler persisted. It is my last request. They could not refuse him and led the old man and the lad to the cave. They left provisions for a few days and then closed up the opening with a huge stone. For three days, they sat in the cave enjoying, enjoying the food and drink but by the fourth day, they began to be frightened and sat gazing at each other silently. On the fifth day, the ruler said to Mordecai, I know that the God of the Jews is all powerful. Pray to him. Perhaps he will take pity on us and perform a miracle to rescue us from this cave. Mordecai withdrew to the end of the cave and began to pray with all his strength until he was so exhausted that he sank in a faint upon the ground. He did not know how long he lay there and whether he was asleep or awake until his eyes opened and he suddenly saw by the light which filtered under the entrance a small worm crawling over the... There's that worm. Yeah. Crawling over the rock. Then he heard a small voice, take hold of the worm, the Shamir and place it on the rock at the entrance. The rock will split and you will walk from the darkness into light. Mordecai, knelt, Mordecai kneeled down and lifting the worm very gently from the wall, went across and placed it on the rock at the entrance. At once there was a loud crack and a huge slit appeared in the rock, wide enough for a man to pass through and the cave was flooded with light. Calling the ruler, he walked with him through the opening into the light of day. The two of them walked through fields and deserts until they reached a port on the shore in which a ship anchored, about to leave for the Holy Land. They embarked and all the journey, the, the ruler could not stop praising Mordecai's God, whose power he had seen at first. Moreover, he at swore first an oath- hand, At first hand. He had, seen, he had seen it firsthand. Moreover, he swore, swore an oath that as soon as they reached land again, he would adopt Judaism. Three years had passed since Mordecai left Salonika, during which time Esther had not ceased to weep for her lost lover. But her weeping did not spoil her beauty. On the contrary, it added to it, giving her, giving her the soulful look of a sad princess. All who saw her were amazed at her charm. 
Now at this time, a new governor came to Salonika from Istanbul and all the leaders of the community came to welcome him, concerned to find out whether he was a kindly or cruel ruler. In either case, they thought it would be wiser to greet him. Soon the governor went to tour the city together with the dignitaries and included in his tour a visit to the rabbi's house. Aha, uh -huh, I think a light bulb just went off. The rabbi, gave, the rabbi gave him every honor, rising from his seat to greet him and urging him to deal kindly with the Jewish community, which had always been loyal subjects to the throne. The rabbi's wife and daughter also entered to pay their respects. And the governor was at once smitten with the charms of the young girl. He, Sorry, he hold on one second, one second. Okay, I'm back. All right. The rabbi's wife and daughter also entered to pay their respects, and the governor was at once smitten with the charms of the young girl. He began to speak to her, and to his astonishment, discovered her to be widely educated, widely educated, and highly intelligent. He could not tear himself away from the house, but sat there for many hours to, to the surprise of his escort, who were waiting for him outside. Even when he returned to his residence, the governor could not forget the girl's beauty, and she was in his thoughts day and night. He could no longer concentrate on his duties, and he began to grow thin and pale. One of his chief advisors, an elderly and trustworthy man, asked him why he was wasting away. The governor, glancing quickly at the man's gray beard, decided to trust him with the truth. I have fallen in love with the rabbi's daughter and cannot get her out of my. Thoughts, if I cannot obtain her, I shall die, even if it means killing her father and mother to get her. Allah has certainly afflicted you, answered the advisor, but I have known the rabbi for years. If you would like, I could go and speak to him. Perhaps he would give you to give her to you in marriage. I know, I know those obstinate Jews too well. They are too loyal to their faith. The rabbi would rather die than see his daughter married to me. Still, if you like. And, and we'll see what happens, replied the governor. In fact, the advisor had once been a servant in the rabbi's house and had been friendly with the rabbi himself since his youth. Secretly, he visited the rabbi and warned him that the governor had fallen in love with his daughter and that if he wished to save her, he should send her at once far away from the city where the governor would be unable to lay hands on her. The rabbi consulted his wife and they determined to send her to Jerusalem where they had a relative, one of the leading scholars of the city who could look after her until they themselves were able to join her. By this time, they had completely forgotten about Mordecai. They called Esther and informed her of the situation that if she remained there and her parents refused to give her to the governor in marriage, he would take revenge on the Jewish community. Consequently, there was only one course open. She must leave at once for Jerusalem and wait there till her parents could join her. The girl was astonished at what she heard, but hurried to gather up her belongings and left secretly that night. A month later, she reached Jerusalem, where she was received with great joy, for she had brought letters from her father to the, her relation and to various other scholars of the city. Soon her reputation for learning had spread throughout the city and in the same way she had taught the yeshiva students in Salonika, so students, so students flocked to the yeshiva note of Jerusalem to learn Torah from her. 
She was given a room to sit in and her students sat in an adjoining room with a small aperture between the two so that the students could hear her and ask her questions. Soon people began to say that never since the days of the famous Gloria, Gloria, the wife of Rabbi Meir, had a, Mayor, had a woman been known to teach so well. A year later, Mordecai and the ruler reached Jerusalem, and the latter fulfilled his vow of becoming a Jew. As for Mordecai, he had only one desire, to study Torah. When he heard of the amazing girl who taught the students so wonderfully, he came, he too came to listen. Not what I, not what I had originally thought. As soon as he heard her voice, his heart began to pound, but he did not dare to believe his senses. One day he took part in the legal discussion and as soon as she heard his voice, the girl almost swooned. She could not continue the class and informing the students that she felt unwell, she went home. Next day, she sent a servant to inquire from the students whether there, there was amongst them named Mordecai. And if so, that he should come to her home since she had something to tell him. There was only one Mordecai there who was a comparative newcomer nobody knew from where. Mordecai went to this teacher's house and as he opened the door, there was his beloved Esther before him. They fell upon each other's necks and wept for joy. That very day, Esther's parents arrived in Jerusalem and Esther welcomed them with, with the words, you see, God has brought you here to witness my betrothal to my beloved Mordecai, he is here. The rabbi gazed at, at them silently and his eyes filled with tears. Yes, he nodded, it is God's will and we poor fools tried to frustrate it. And the parents gave their children their blessing. To this day, the elderly people still recall that never had Jerusalem been so happy, seen. So ha had seen so happy a wedding as that of Mordecai and Esther. There they are. So, okie doke. Interesting, very yeah. different take. That's the, that's the story of Mordechai and Esther from Salonika. So um, obviously this is in many ways just a typical kind of folk tale, fairy tale, um, but uh, still I think it has some intriguing features to it. Um, anybody uh, wanna talk about some of the things that they noticed? Yes, Carol. The, 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 the ship, the, the, getting on a ship and the ship uh, either crashing or ha running into problems. That's been a theme through several of the stories you have told. And when I said, I think I got it, I thought when the new governor came, that would have been Mordecai. So that's where I was completely wrong. But true love wins out. Right. Well, that's in the stories. That's true. Yes. Um, Lynn, yeah. Well, also, <clears throat> Esther's father was admonishing him for being so stupid. And then the first thing they say about him when the pirates take him in is how smart he is. And then the next society that he's with makes him a judge. So I, I, I mean, did, I mean, I know it's best not to be too literal, but did Esther just sort of like open up learning in general for him or was he waiting for her? Or it's just curious to me that everyone thought he was stupid except the Jews. Well, even the Jews thought he was stupid. Remember in the beginning- I meant the other way around. The Jews were the one that thought he was stupid, but everyone else saw what a great learner he was. So but I'm just curious. But apparently it wasn't just that they, they, they were prejudiced. Apparently he couldn't learn. Remember when the rabbi was trying to teach him, um, he, didn't, he didn't make any headway whatsoever. So we have this mysterious transformation where when he finally sits and studies with Esther, something cracks open, something changes. Right, um, and uh, it's meant, you know, for us to wonder about it. You know, is is it that special chemistry between them? You know, was he yeah. obviously he? The story, in its own kind of simple way, tells us this guy was tr completely traumatized. Right, he had a terrible childhood. He was a refugee kid who was, you know, wandering around and and couldn't even remember where he was coming from, or who his parents were. Um, so there's there's plenty of good reason for him to be blocked in terms of his own you know, uh, abilities, but then she frees him, so to speak, you're right. And uh, you know, that's the first, that's, and then they fall in love, right? You know, as they're studying together. 
Yeah, Carol. Well, when, when we've all been in school, there are some teachers that you can bond with and can and they can help you so much better than other teachers. And maybe Esther's um, manner and way she taught him, I got the impression it was sweetly and gently and patiently where the rabbi probably wasn't that way so that you can learn more from one teacher. You can learn the same subject, you can learn more from one teacher than you can from the other, depending on their personalities and how some clash and some don't. So let's talk about uh, this special teacher that, that uh, um, named Esther. What else is uh, remarkable about her? She was allowed to, she was allowed to learn. And, and we're female, females in that, in, in that time frame, from what I'm understanding, basically weren't educated. She right. was educated. So she was not only was she allowed to learn, she was a teacher par excellence. She taught in the yeshiva. She she was uh, allowed to be, you know, a, a sage and a, and a uh, um, an educator, a rabbi without the title, um, just like the men. So she is very very special, and that doesn't come just because she happens to be sm smart and charming. And we keep on being told how. How beautiful she is, but this, as you say, so you know, socially speaking, sociologically speaking, doesn't matter how smart you were. You know, read 19th century, uh, you know, uh, English novels. Uh, just mm -hmm. because a woman is smart doesn't mean that she gets to be, you know, co, you know, decide her own life uh, path. So she the was fact that she's, you know, standing up for herself, refusing to get married. Um, fact that she's that she is a force to be reckoned with that she that the, that the community allows her to have this position of power as a as a Torah teacher is quite extraordinary right and it says something of course about the, the reality of the community that tells this story but this is a wonder story this is a miracle story you know this is this is not you know oh you know so this student finally found the right teacher right this is this is a, a, a story about a, a woman who knows her own mind, who you know becomes um, what is impossible for women to become, the highest value of that community that's always kept away from the women is something that she takes and she is better than anybody. Remember that's that be whole beginning part where each person, uh, each suitor that that comes, she trips them up, she asks some questions that they don't know the answers to. And then what happens eventually to that uh, that whole uh, you know cavalcade of people that that uh, want to come and, and marry her? They go away. They don't want to be bested by a woman. Right, right. So so they 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 are so afraid of that embarrassment, you know, that they that they don't even want forget it. I don't want to. I don't want to try you know and and, and become publicly uh, uh, humiliated by a woman. So there's this back and forth going on here between her very uh, special attainments and, and strength. Um, and yet at the other hand, um, you know, there's still the entrenched feelings uh, that people that people have uh, about the right place of, of women. What about what 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 about her father and mother? What about what about them? I think there was they were a bit of snobs because they thought they felt Mordecai was below this their their station and uh, it wasn't to be. Okay. What else? What else do we know about them? What other kind of values or or uh, um, prejudices or opinions or or you know uh, do they have? I think Josie's talking, but we're you're muted. They're Josie. very much part of their time and place. They they have the same values and as leaders of the community, they're probably even more entrenched. They're not, they're so, not very so is that really true? Is that, is that really true? Didn't they uh, encourage, didn't the father bring her along and, and, and uh, on the trips and, and, and taught her and actually made her into the Torah scholar that she was? But when it came to family life they were very conservative all right so that's what so it gets complicated in other words there's there's a little bit of this but there's also a little bit of that right in certain ways they were not at all as as entrenched as as uh, as the rest of the community they some fostered 
you know, this development of their, of their child to become a, a, you know, a, a young adult that, uh, who really, you know, completely fulfilled her talents and her, and her uh, you know, gifts. Um, but can't you at least like, can't you at least like just get a nice marriage and, and go along with it? Um, unfortunately, I didn't put it together. Maybe, maybe uh, if, if we have some time, I'm gonna to try to remember for next time. There's, there is a story, it's very full of legends because there isn't a lot of material about it, but there, you know, the, the, a learned woman was very rare, but here and there it actually happened. And uh, there are stories about, about the struggle that a woman had in that kind of situation. The truth is I never saw Yentl, I never read the, the, uh, the story, but- uh, You're but missing yeah, something. I'm telling you, but, uh, but, but you know, this push and pull, you know, how much can you have your career? What about family, right? Those questions haven't gone away yet. Right. Um, you know, uh, so, so her parents, are very, very um, upset with her that she doesn't, that she's gonna be a spinster, she's gonna be an old maid. And already, you know, like, as, as you pointed out, they're all so class conscious, class conscious. Yeah, he's a no that, 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 come on, you know, and, and that's taken for granted. Everybody knows that, right? Everybody knows that there are the people on top, there's the upstairs and that there's the downstairs. Right. Everybody knows that that's the way society is built, and uh, that's you know that's the way it is. So even Mordechai, he knows he can't really hope to marry her because right. he's below her station. Right. So this is this is like a you know a constant story in you know in every culture um, that 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 this is you know the reality. So so. Uh, um, so then Mordechai has all of these adventures, right? So uh, um, first of all, had ev has everybody uh, come across this, uh, this uh, worm uh, business before? So this is not invented by this story. The Shamir is a part of rabbinic legends from you know, a couple of thousand years ago. We're in the middle of the, we're beginning the Torah readings uh, for setting up the Mishkan, the tabernacle, in the desert, right? And then the tabernacle is the basis for then our building a temple in Jerusalem. So the tabernacle was made out of portable materials, made out of wood and yarn and animal skins. And, uh, you know, you, you made everything so that you could carry it around from one place to another. Um, but when we made a temple, um, then the materials that the, the temple was built uh, and, the, and for instance, the altar was built out of stone. And God says, when you build out of stone, does anybody remember the, the special condition about what you're allowed, how you're allowed to build with, with uh, the, the stone uh, objects? The Torah says, do not raise your sword to, uh, as as to way to chop the, the stone, right? Don't use metal to cut the stone because it's like a it's like um, a sword, and it's a, um, a a tool of war. And, you should and there be. should be no tool of war used to create God's house. So this is in the Torah itself. And then when we go into the stories of Solomon building the temple. We, we, we say, and, and there, this, the, the story, not, there was never a sound of any metal beating against the stone because they didn't use any metal implements. So the rabbis uh, had a big problem. So how are they gonna make the stone bricks? You know, how are they gonna make the, the, the pieces that are all gonna come together? And their answer was, there was this worm. There was the shamir. The Shamir means the, the, the uh, um, protected one from Shomre Amuna, right? Um, and the Shamir was this kind of like laser gun that as it would creep along, um, they, would, they would draw a path for the Shamir, how they wanted the stone cut, and the Shamir would, would, would creep on the, on the stone, and as it was creeping along, the stone would get cut. 
So this is the, the rabbinic uh, solution to how people were actually supposed to uh, be able to um, cut the stones in the quarry to be able to make the, uh, the, the building of the, of the temple. So that's borrowed here for, you know, for, this, for this story. Um, and it's used uh, for the sake of, of getting uh, them out of uh, you know, kind of a Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, you, know, you know, terrible, uh, you know, dangerous situation. Um, so that middle part of the story, what, you know, that whole part about the, about the adventures, you know, so it was already pointed out, we see that everybody appreciates what a smart guy this guy is. He's a talented guy. He's got a good head on his shoulders and he keeps on being, uh, you know, recognized as being uh, someone who should be trusted and so on. Another biblical parallel, anybody uh, want to bring up where that might be something uh, that we've heard before in the Torah? The way the shipwreck with Jonah. So the shipwreck is a Jonah story. But what about this business about the young whippersnapper who, you know, is a slave and then- and Joseph. Joseph. Yeah, this is the typical Joseph uh, uh, story. Yeah. Right? So uh, where, where they, all, they all recognize, oh, this guy's talents are just undeniable, that right? Was, so, um, and what about, what about the description of these two societies that the Mordechai finds himself in? They're oh. subpar. <laughs> <laughs> they're, what? They're, they're subpar. The one, uh, the pirates share the booty equally, which is the uh, quote unquote, their only virtue or the only good thing about the society is that they, they share the loot with each other. Which is not not a small thing. That's true. <laughs> that's, that, that's a pretty good, uh, you know, quality to have. Um, but uh, yeah, but th that, you know, there's this whole detailed des description of how they worship their God with this, you know, with the blood and the, and the, and the, uh, the dancing naked and the whole thing. Um, what, what is, what is that, what is that about? Samson and the Phil Philistines? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a little bit of like, let's put some local color in here. Right. Let's let's uh, the the storyteller is having a good time. Yeah. Well, jazz. jazzing up jazzing up the story a little bit, um, and uh, at the expense of of the the barbarous barbarous barbarian non Jewish uh, uh, right. you know uh, uh, groups that are around, um, and then of course there's the second one, and they have an interesting uh, you know uh, custom also right. Oh, they take the old king out. <laughs> right, like, right. As soon as, as soon as you get to retirement age, as soon as you get to retirement age, that's it. You know, throw throw them into the into the you know into the place there and 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 let them rot. Like so uh, so and and actually these are um, to a certain extent you can read the you know books of anthropology and stuff. There are there are things like that, and in fact, is a uh, classic work called The Golden Bow uh, mm. by Sir James Frazier. Uh, he's an English anthropologist, uh, you know, uh, whenever it is, you know, quite a while back, a hundred years ago, more. And uh, it's actually connected to the Purim story um, where there is this idea of you have to kill the king every year in order to placate the gods and renew the gods' blessings now, it's also another kind of fertility in both of these, both of these cases, both in the in the first pirate, uh, uh, you know, primitive society, and and in the African society, both of them are engaging in things which are uh, recognized in the world as as a kind of tribal efforts to, to renew them. life and to bring, uh, um, you know. Uh, uh, just like the you know the the crops have to come back out of the soil they die you know winter is the time of death and then spring is the rebirth so uh, um this is different ways that that these uh, uh kinds of myths are acted out and some people see um the Haman story uh as as part of as part of a that uh, that whole story that's why he that's how, why he gets executed so that the the new rebirth can happen Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so there's a Purim uh, connection here besides the two, the names of Esther and, and Mordechai. 
There was a section there when uh, the pirates tried to loot the ship and, and they were taken and some were thrown overboard. And they said that they were going to Africa to, for, to put these people in, in to, it's to sell them as slaves. And I automatically re thought of the reverse of how, how people in Africa were, were captured and brought over to the United States to be slaves. Right. So that's, of course, our um, own burden to, to, to be responsible for. But the truth of the matter is, is that slave trading was all over the globe. And uh, um, it, it, was, it was everywhere. And Africa was certainly brutalized by, by Western you know, countries, by the, by the European countries, and, and devastated in terms of taking all those people out of Africa to be slaves. But slave trading was happening in Africa. African peoples were, were capturing each other and being slaves. The is, Islam was very uh, uh, active, you know, because if you were a trader, this was one of the major businesses in trading was, was slavery. And then, of course, with Jews, um, all, all people that were captured were in danger of being enslaved. And, and Jews were always worried about that. Jews were always uh, uh, afraid that uh, if they were doing business, um, they may uh, get captured at sea and then, uh, ha and then be enslaved. And there was a tremendous amount during the Middle Ages, there was a tremendous amount of activity of ransoming captives of saving uh, people from slavery. I think, I think we actually had a story where, where that was part of uh, the story also. So um, we had a lot of stories actually. You know, by now, as we're coming up to Purim, Purim is, is the marker, the year marker. Purim was the last celebration we had in our shul and we closed down two days later. Yeah. So uh, we've, been, we've, been, we've been going for a while here. So um, with regard to Purim, any other connections uh, to the Purim story in any little faint echoes or, or clear echoes? The, I think the big di dinner party they had with the, when the new governor came, because re remember, uh, Vashti didn't come to the king and then uh, Esther, when she was queen, came to him and to, to ask him to sit to, to what Haman was trying to do. So uh, they were the big feast. So Salonika is, is in Greece, but of course we have this Turkish um, uh, overlay because the, the, this is, they were part of the Ottoman Empire, right? For, for uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, the Ottoman Empire you know, spread all through the, the lower, uh, uh, all through the, the whole circle of the Mediterranean from the European side down to the Northern Africa and, and into the Middle East. Um, so the Jewish community is wor always worried and always nervous about being on good terms with the rulers, just like the Jewish community in Persia had to be on good terms with the ruling authorities there. And they're never quite sure, are we going to have a good authority or are we going to have a mean authority? Are we going to have somebody who's going to be nice to the Jews or are we going to have somebody who's going to have it out for the Jews? Right, so, so let's go and meet him and let's do the best we can, right? And that's the situation in, this, in the Purim story. There's, the Jews are living in, in, in Shushan, they're living in the Persian Empire, and they seem to be doing okay. Of course, how did they get into the Persian Empire? Because the Babylonians conquered Israel and, and you know, slaughtered them and, and, and exiled them. But now the Persians seem to be better. But uh-oh, now there's this Haman guy who's out to get them. And, and creates a, you know, a, a, a situation where he has a decree from the king that it's okay to slaughter the Jews. So the, 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 the precarious nature of Jewish existence in the diaspora is a reality that you know, the fairy tales are just working on the reality. Um, what does the African king say to Mordechai when he finds out who he is? Yeah, Lynn. Yeah, he says, don't, you can't tell anybody because you're not allowed to live here. I don't tell, don't give, don't say who, you're, who you are. Don't say you're a Jew. Echo of this Purim story? Of course. Yeah. That's, how Esther, tells gets, Esther. that's how Esther, Esther gets to be, to be queen. Because Mordechai tells her, don't you dare say who you are. Right? Don't say you're a Jewish person. 
Right? That's the whole big dramatic giveaway at the at the at the you know at another one of those parties, the parties that are, keep happening in this. So in the end, when she goes, "Hey, Haman, you want to get rid of all the Jews? Guess what? What do you think I am?" Oh, right, and that's this like you know shocker. Um, but uh, so this idea that you have to be sort of like undercover in 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 the way that you're uh, getting along and making making uh, making your path through life. Um, yeah, Lynn. Just an added dimension to the first, um, the governor, the new, the new ruler uh, that falls in love with Esther. I, um, he, he falls in love with her and wants to marry her, but he knows that they won't let him marry her because she's a Jew and those people are so wiggy about keeping themselves Jewish. And then he says he, he's gonna marry her. He doesn't even talk to them or approach them. He just says, I'm gonna marry her even if I have to kill the parents. And, and it doesn't happen, but there's this sense of, I don't know what the word is. I mean, he falls in love with her, but then at the same time, they're not worth fight. They're not worth my asking for her hand. They're not worth- Well, yeah, that. yeah, this is, I mean, and this is, yeah, you're pointing out one of these kinds of like really sick kinds of uh, uh, traditions that exist in certain ways almost to today. You know, the man will have his way no matter what. He's not going to take no for an answer. Um, if he's a ruler, then he's certainly by divine right, he's entitled to whatever he wants. Um, on the other hand, you know, if he would like to do it the simple way. I'd like to not have any trouble here if you would say that you give your daughter to me in marriage. Of course, he doesn't care whether she wants to be married to him or not. That's also, you know, ir irrelevant. But if you want to say not, you know, yes, then I would like to look like a nice guy and I would like to have no trouble here. But, you know, if you want to give me trouble, then, you know, you'll pay for it. Now that's the gangster mentality. And unfortunately, that's also often the male mentality. Um, you know, and it's just it's just uh, uh, exacerbated when that when the male has a lot of power. So, but let I was I thought you were going now. Let's go back to the Purim thing. Um, of course, we have a very powerful ruler um, in the in the Purim story also, right? That's Achashverosh. And in that story, Esther does become his wife, right? as opposed to in this story where it's out of the question. There's no way that we're gonna allow our daughter Esther to, to be the wife of this uh, uh, Turkish uh, non-Jewish uh, uh, person. But the circumstances were different. Yeah. Esther, came, right. Esther came to him. Mordecai suggested that Esther go to him when he was looking to replace Vashti. So it's Why? like he chose her because she let him, she was there Why? to be one of right. the ones to be You're picked. Right. So, so, it's uh, completely different from, the, from this one. Well, it's the opposite, but I don't know. I'm asking, right. what's the difference? What is the difference? She volunteered. Why, yeah, why? Why would she volunteer? I, I, I might not be getting the whole picture of, but Mordecai, he's he loves Esther, blah blah blah. But he's using her as a political tool. He wants to get her in in a position of power. I mean, he knows she's beautiful. She's worth being the queen. Okay, we get that. But he's He's putting, I don't know if he knows this is gonna happen or just things are bad. We gotta get someone in the White House who can help us out <laughs> instead of persecute us. But he's he's really, it's Interesting back way to that ancient it, mentality, right? He's really using yeah. her, Esther. Yes, at the beginning of the story, there's no indication that the Jews have anything to worry about. When he so you know he doesn't he doesn't say I want you to be queen so that you can save our lives. It's only afterwards he says who knows maybe it's yeah. specifically for this time that you became. But at the beginning yes he's pushing her and he's actually making her do something which is you know the Jewish com you know community would say in general this is terrible this is a violation this is a betrayal of our community you're voluntarily leaving our community to marry this guy. What, what, what do you think you're doing? So there's, you know, it just highlights that the Purim story is this wonderful story. It's great for the kids. We have a great time. There's a lot of dark undercurrents. There's a lot of moral questions 
that are raised by the Purim story, which we sort of try to, uh, um, or we success, successfully very often just glide right by them. But what's going on with this? Why is Mordechai putting her up to it? And I, and I would suggest it comes back to that sense of insecurity. Yeah. He is willing to, to push her to do this terrible um, sin from the, from the perspective of everybody that's, that's involved. Um, but to buy that influence, to, to make it just in case, just in case, we need it. We need to have somebody that's going to be our double agent, right? And of course, that's the way double agents always are. They have to sacrifice themselves, their own identity, um, for the sake of the people that they can't identify with, right? Um, and and that's what Esther has to do. She does this on behalf of the Jewish people, but she can't be open about being a Jew. It's, it's, a, it's, it's one of the tragic and uh, difficult situations that have happened throughout Jewish history again and again and again. In this story that we had, the fairy tale, it's all happy endings. Everybody gets to escape the, you know, in the nick of time and, and everybody sees the light in the end. Um, so it's all good. Um, and we have this very strong heroine, Esther gets her way. She's the one who has the, uh, um, you know, the abilities to, to, to discern the good guys uh, from, the, from, the, from the less. Uh, she sees Mordecai for, what, for who he is, even when he's just a little uh, bedraggled you know, uh, uh, refugee. So all good things. So a charming story, so to speak, but with yep. a lot of uh, background to it. That's more than just a childish uh, you know, story. All right, I want to wish everyone a very, very wonderful Purim. You too. And, uh, and uh, um, I hope we'll be able to continue next time. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, okay, guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.